So the program is called The Word at Night, and or we call it Tuan, uh, standing for this um, name. It started in 2007, but most of us in the Tuan team uh, has been involved with these kind of imaging many years before that. Uh, my story started in the early 90s when I was a teenager. We have members such as Wally Paholka is based in Southern California, and he started doing this before I was born. Or David Malin, he's in Australia, one of our members and advisors, and one of the main inspiration for me when I became an eye to sky photographer. Um, so there are very diverse group of people here. Some are much younger than me too. Uh, in about 20 countries or so. The images you're seeing in this presentation are mainly mine, but those which are made by our members, I will um, give credit and explain that. The Word of Night photography is not necessarily about astronomy. It is, of course, as a part of it. But in a broader sense, we like to present the nighttime environment to people, um, the, the nighttime environment that they have been disconnected from due to the modern way of life, due to light pollution, and being disconnected from nature, basically, in most part of the urban world. Uh, and therefore, it's, it can begin right after sunset. It can go all the way to few moments before sunrise. Like this one is just moments after sunset, I'm using a filter to stop down the light, ND filter, and increase the exposure to 30 seconds in order to get these motion of the clouds in the caldera on the island of La Palma, one of the astronomer's paradise, because uh, it's home to a major observatory and it has a crystal clear sky um, as part of European Union. It's on the Canary Island of La Palma. I go there every year for my annual masterclass called Astro Master La Palma in May. This year, unfortunately, I missed that due to the pandemic, but I hope uh, I can do it again in May 2021. So a bit later, for example, here, um, again, moments after sunset, uh, you start to see the first atmospheric phenomena, which is happening twice every 24 hour, but most people are not aware of that, and it's called the Earth shadow. When you look at this very wide angle panorama, on the right side, you see a blue band. This is the shadow of our own planet casting on the atmosphere. And as the night begins, the shadow is just uh, getting thicker and thicker and then gets connected to the blue sky. Uh, but at the very beginning, uh, after sunset, you look opposite direction of the sun, 180 degrees away, which is also visible on this image. On the left side, you see the sunset. And on the right side, you see the Earth's shadow rising. Above it, you see some of the anti crepuscular rays forming, so two atmospheric phenomena. And the coloration is interesting, too, because the left side of the Grand Canyon is illuminated by the Earth's shadow and the blue-purple band, and the right side is illuminated by the dusk color. A uh, closer shot of the... Um, panorama, you see also an extinct volcano right on the edge of the canyon. Same phenomena now in the morning sky uh, above Kilimanjaro in, on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. The crepuscular rays are forming due to the clouds on the horizon, uh, moon and Venus on the left side of the sky above Acacia tree. Some of the images are about the cultural importance of each location or the natural resources they have. Like here in Ambaseli National Park of Kenya, the story I was following was how this man, uh, a tribe leader of Maasai people, is known as one of the best, um, has, in one, have, has one of the best eyesight at nighttime. And people were relying on him to recognize the animals at nighttime when the animals are, especially predators, are approaching the village. Uh, so I, when I heard about that, I asked him to join me uh, to find the animals at night under moonlight. And he could see almost everything that I couldn't. And I, I was raised as an amateur astronomer. I always thought that I have a very good eyesight at night. 
And when he was showing me, for example, that giraffe on the left side, it was totally invisible to me unless I took the picture with the telephoto lens for two seconds and the giraffe was there. Um, the Kilimanjaro is under almost 70 percent um, moon phase light, which is enough to illuminate the landscape almost like daytime. A closer view of two of the giraffe and there is a zebra somewhere too. Um, so later in the night, the moon was gone and it was totally dark with some clouds passing by, but there are also two heavenly clouds much further beyond, almost uh, 200,000 light years away, are the two neighboring satellite galaxies known as the Magellanic Clouds. You see them in the center and the right side. Uh, the large Magellanic Cloud is very evident and bold to the eye, even visible from some of the urban areas if it's not too light polluted. On the left side, uh, a cloud is shining in, per in pink and red. This is the Carina Nebula, the largest nebula um, which is visible to the eye and uh, it's colorless to the eye because uh, unfortunately our eyes are color blinded at low light. So when you go under the night the sky you don't see the color of the Milky Way or these nebulosity. Uh, but you can see the color of some of the brighter stars because the intensity of the light and its concentration can activate the cone cells in, um, in the retina. But the diffuse objects such as the Milky Way or any nebula cannot do that unless you gather enough light through a large telescope uh, to see the colors of some of these objects. With unaided eyes, although they're colorless, but it's still spectacular when you're under such a dark sky. So Carina Nebula is much larger and brighter than Orion Nebula in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but most people are not aware of that, those who are in the Northern Hemisphere and starting to be an amateur astronomer, um, know Orion Nebula very well, but this one is even more spectacular through a telescope. Now we are in the Northern Hemisphere, and you're looking at Antares and the Milky Way above the Yellowstone National Park. In some of my images, the foreground uh, received the natural night, uh, light of the environment, but the ambient night light here was very weak, so I painted the um, the hot spring with a portable LED light, uh, which is resulting in this high contrast image. From Yellowstone, we are across the planet in Nepal. The source of illumination here is now the moonlight, which is the most uniform and usually uh, gives you the best result. I was on the way to Everest Base Camp, and as we were increasing the altitude, this was one of the best views um, as the night began in uh, somewhere near Namche Bazaar, which is the port, uh, a portal to every space camp. But when you look at these images from around the world, you come to a universality message, which I later on explain. Uh, it tells you that we are all under one sky, regardless of what kind of foreground you see, what kind of symbol of a country from Everest in Nepal and Tibet, to Yellowstone in the US or in a national park in Kenya, um, the sky is like one single roof above all of us. So the, the World at Night project has this universal message that night to sky can be a bridge between civilizations by this um, idea mentality. But it has other messages too. Um, it tells you that the night to sky is not only a laboratory to astronomers, it is indeed. But in a broader context, the night sky is part of our nature. It's 50% of our nighttime environment. And when it's gone, you lose 50% of natural night environment, which is lost in many parts of the world due to the light pollution. So we are fighting with light pollution with beautiful images. Uh, and the messages comes with them. Some of the images also show the light pollution itself. Although this word is very known to amateur astronomers and professionals across the world, and they're fighting with it in the past five, six decades very strongly, but to most people it's still unheard of. 
uh, you might be surprised, but in my talks around the world, I noticed that most people never heard about light pollution. So there needs to be much more done in order to preserve these last remaining night skies. Again, moonlight. Now we are another, in another high altitude area in South America and Chile. This is the border of Chile and Bolivia. And not far from this place is where uh, one of the world's largest radio telescopes, uh, an array of 66 dishes called ALMA is located. But when you look at the center of the image, something surprising comes to the view to the Northern Hemisphere observers, and that's the Orion upside down. Uh, this familiar view of the Orion in the Northern Hemisphere is not like this. <laughs> And this is a, an educational lesson. As soon as you go to the Southern Hemisphere, you realize the familiar constellations are upside down there. In the fo foreground is um, an ice forest, a typical formation uh, in the Andes. La Palma, Canary Islands in moonlight. Sirius on the upper left is the brightest star in the Earth night sky. Planets such as Jupiter or Mars these nights, which is uh, very bright due to being in opposition with the Earth, are brighter than Sirius. But as a star in the nighttime, Sirius it is the brightest because it's very close to the Sun, only eight light years away in the galactic scale, scale it's very, very close. Then the second brightest star is also visible in this image. If you look at the horizon, that's Canopus. Uh, it doesn't look bright because it's right on the horizon. And it's interesting that you can see this southern star even from many of the northern latitudes. Uh, anywhere typically under 35 degrees, Canopus start to appear. Uh, here at 28 degrees latitude, it comes um, a bit high above, over the southern hemisphere, uh, southern horizon. Sometimes the light comes from the sky but not necessarily from twilight or the moon, could be from aurora if you're in the right latitude. This was in Iceland, one side of the sky shows how dark it can be without aurora, and the other side shows how dominating can the northern, northern lights be. I have um, friends who I am collaborating with in Iceland for our um, aurora photo tours. We do it twice a year and we are going to start it again in 2021. And they hate Aurora. <laughs> they're from Iceland and they're amateur astronomers, they're deep sky photographers. They only go outside to their observatory when Aurora activity is zero. As soon as it's one or two, <laughs> they cancel the observation because it can be very um, dominating in the sky, but many other people travel from far distance to Iceland and other countries just to see that. But they're born with aurora, so they're a bit probably bored with the lights. Uh, these lights can move very fast. You don't see the color as vivid as to this image, unless the aurora activity is really intense, then you start to see the color. The first one, uh, very easy to see, is green, because our eyes are more uh, sensitive to this part of the spectrum, and green is a dominating part of aurora. Uh, then comes the red, then comes purple, yellow, and very hard to see is blue in the aurora colors. Let me just uh, go through the, um, the sources of light one more time. It could be twilight, it could be moon, it could be artificial light, such as a road, a village, light pollution, a glow of a far city, it could be just a starlight and the Milky Way, or even zodiacal light or aurora and a glass could be just air glow, which is a natural uh, glow of the Earth's upper atmosphere. And it's a problem for astronomers sometimes using large telescopes, but for um, photographers, it's an opportunity to document one of the interesting atmospheric phenomena, which could be quite intense sometimes and confusing for photographers who think this is um, an aurora in a wrong latitude. I will show you some examples. So on, on the image in the right side, which has a very interesting story for me because back in 2007, I decided to completely shift to digital photography after many, some years of film. And this was the image that made me the decision. When I realized the camera is 
capable of doing uh, almost noise-free image at nighttime uh, with proper colors and everything, I decided to move to digital. It was in Iran. I, I was living in Iran until 2011. And I started the Board at Night project uh, in Iran when I was based there, but with collaboration of my colleague, uh, Mike Simmons in the US, which I will explain later on. Back to this image, there are three main sources of light. On the, uh, on the earth, you see moonlight, which is also visible in the sky because the sky is blue. Naturally, the blue sky is only visible in the image when there is either twilight or moonlight. If none of these exist, the, the image is in the middle of the night without moon, and you still see the blue light, that means your color balance of the image is wrong and you have shifted the color balance in order to artificially create the blue sky, which is okay for artistic reason, but it will change the natural color of the night sky, including the natural color of the stars and the Milky Way. Then it became a problem if you're shooting for a documentary style of photography. Then there is a road, which is illuminating the rocks in red, it's almost like a lava flow, but it's uh, just the road. And the light pollution on the right side is adding to the image from a far city. And uh, up on the image is um, the winter constellation Orion and Canis Major, or uh, the great dog with the brightest star series. And I think night sky photography is really the art of handling the ambient lights besides knowing about the night sky and knowing the technique. This is just stars and the Milky Way and air glow. There is nothing else. And uh, I don't do photo blending. Um, many of the night escape photographers uh, like to practice that. That means taking images of a very different exposure. One is 20 minutes, the other one is 20 seconds, one is daytime, one is nighttime, and blend them together for a digital uh, representation of the sky, uh, digital art, which is okay, but I don't practice that. And I like to continue with single exposure, and these are all single exposures. Those which are not, uh, for technical reason, I will explain. So these single exposure images are technically challenging because you are limited to the Earth rotation speed. As the Earth is rotating, the sky is turning above us, and therefore stars become trailed. And because of those trails, uh, we are not able to uh, maximize the exposure in order to get enough photons. So 20 second exposure, um, it's sometimes not enough. So uh, therefore you have to use a very fast wide angle lens, um, which is a very key to, to night escape photography. This is in southern coast of Australia, uh, in the Great Ocean Road. Uh, the sky is pretty dark, but on the far left side, you still see two light domes. One is coming from a mine, the other is a small village nearby. Um, but the rest of the horizon over the south is completely free of any source of light pollution because there is nothing else until you get to Antarctica and there's nothing there either. Uh, with the curvature of the earth, you don't see it anyhow. Uh, above the horizon in the center is the Southern Cross and the Alpha and Beta Centauri. We continue with the definition of night escape photography. It could be cityscapes or architectural wonders. It could be um, night sky above interesting landscape, or it can express principles of practical astronomy. And to our members in the World at Night group, it's very important to include these practical astronomy elements so educators and uh, science journalists can use these images for communicating astronomy with people. But it's often at a time and location that also record a celestial phenomenon, such as aurora or um, a conjunction or something rare happening in the sky. And as a part of nature documentary photography, it's based on realistic documentation of the natural world. So we are careful not changing the colors of the night sky very aggressively or not blending images taken in daytime and nighttime, or blending images taken in different locations or with different lenses. 
Um, so these are uh, some of the criteria within the Tuan group. Not every member follow that 100%, but we like to um, suggest it to the, to the Tuan members. Let's go on with another example. Although these images present the beauty of the night sky as seen with the naked eye, from the angle point of view, they're often much deeper than what you can see with the naked eye. Like this image goes to the stars of magnitude eight and nine. With the unaided eye, you see magnitude six, 6.5, something in that range under a dark sky like this, depending of course on your age and on your eyesight. Uh, a typical 10, 20 second exposure at high ISO and fast lens can quickly get you to magnitude eight and nine. If you're using a telephoto lens, it can even reach to magnitude 11, 12. So these cameras are pretty sensitive nowadays. Uh, I have images of only five second exposure through a telephoto lens that reveals the central star of M57, which is the ring nebula, and that's almost 15. So magnitude 15 in um, tripod photography without any tracking is nowadays possible. So we can't really claim these images are exactly what the night sky visible to the unaided eye, and they have more colors, but the field of view is usually similar. That's why they connect people to astronomy and night sky but they lack serious scientific data. We're not going to discover anything here. Sometimes accidentally happens. We're not going to resolve very small details of celestial objects because they're mostly with wide angle images, so wide angle lenses. But not all the time. Sometimes we use uh, extreme long telephoto lenses too, such as this one is with a 500 millimeter lens. I was um, living in Germany on the border of France for several years and going to Paris frequently. So on one of these visits, uh, visits I planned for moon setting above Champs-Élysées and the Arc. Uh, and when you're looking at that, uh, it was interesting because some of the lights on top of the modern part of Paris, the La Défense, was visible as a stars in, in the backdrop of the sky and the moon was just going through them. Uh, but unfortunately, my location was very limited. When you want to shoot a moon with a landmark in a very long telephoto lens, you have to be exactly on that place. A few yards away can change your point of view. Um, and that angle was exactly in the middle of the street. So <laughs> I couldn't stand there for a very long time until police officers came to me. Uh, it was about 11 p.m. or so. And we had a very nice chat. Usually it ends up very friendly because people have some interest in the night sky and they can understand you. I've been captured in many countries by police officers due to photography at nighttime. But most of them, Fortunately, not all of them uh, were happily ended. Any photo, I would say, has these four elements when it becomes powerful enough to communicate with people. Art and technique is very obvious, but then comes moment and a story. Story is usually lost in many of the beautiful images you see it's shared on social media. I think without the story, the image is not complete. Um, why are you presenting this image? What the story you like to tell? Um, story that people are disconnected from the natural elements of night sky visible above them due to living inside the city, story of light pollution, a story of an environmental issue we are dealing with. Um, so these are important things that I recommend to night sky photographers to concentrate on. Just releasing beautiful images of night sky nowadays is not enough because people are saturated with all these eye candies on social media. So image should have a moment and story to be powerful enough to make a change, to make an impact on the society. Let's just talk briefly about some of the techniques uh, we need. Uh, it's basically very simple from technology point of view because you, you're shooting with a camera and a fixed tripod. 
I'm using a remote cable as well. This is a remote shutter release in order to avoid touching the camera, but also to set uh, the camera for time-lapse sequence. Um, sometimes uh, you add a few ac accessories, such as a tracking mount. A star tracker can let you to have a bit more exposure with landscape in the foreground without blending in, in a single exposure. Sometimes you add a filter in front. For example, in a few of my images, there is a filter called diffuser or fog filter that uh, increase the color intensity around the stars in order to show the constellations and the star color diversity in the image better, which is not a new technique. It was in fact done by many photographers in the film time. I first learned it from Akira Fuji uh, in images published in Sky and Telescope magazine. And then from um, exposure and setting point of view, it's not that challenging either. I will come to the challenges, but first, compare these two, very compact, and then you are fixed on one location. So comparison of night sky um, photography, as we call it night escape or Tuana style photography, some people refer to, or wide, wide angle and escape astrophotography. Um, these are based on very compact gears because you have to move from one location to the other during the night. You have to find a proper foreground that matches with your idea of the image you're doing. But in deep sky photography, you're polar lining this large mount and the telescope and you're not going to move that night. Sometimes even several nights, the telescope is there during uh, the photography session. And you are aiming for one or two targets usually to gather in a flight during the whole night uh, to stack them later and create a deep astrophoto. So the style is very different, but they can complete each other. When you put them together, they can give a complete scale of the object people can communicate with. Because the deepest sky photo on the right side of Orion Nebula, uh, to most people is a beautiful, colorful image of the deep cosmos. It's like an abstract painting. It has no meaning of a scale, no meaning of um, science inside until you start to communicate and complete it with a wide angle view so people can move from the earth to the universe with these two together. Um, on the left side, you see a wide angle image almost similar to um, eye resolving power. So the um, squared marked area in Orion Nebula, in Orion constellation, is the nebula as we can see with our own eyes, without the color. So we see a diffuse kind of unfocused star near the belt of Orion. And this is about one degree. So when you're shooting with the telescope, that covers the field of view of your telescope. So these two uh, tells you that the Orion Nebula and these deep images by Hubble Space Telescopes or even amateur astrophotographers are really, really small areas in the sky to the unaided eyes. I just um, briefly mentioned about our limit with the Earth rotation, and this video will give you a better idea of what is happening. One side uh, is the time-lapse video created from this sequence of about 500 images. On the right side, this sequence is stacked together on a multi-exposure image and animated to show you how these trails are formed. So just one more time. These trails are formed as the Earth is rotating and turning the sky above us. If you continue the sequence and long exposure for several hours, then you have very long trails in your white field um, image. It's taken from a high altitude area in Altiplano in Chile. Another example, now the camera is pointed towards the North Celestial Pole, marked by relatively bright star Polaris, or the North Star, from Nepal. Since now you're pointing towards the Earth axis of rotation, you can um, see these uh, circumpolar stars. 
the trails are all centralized to that pole, which is almost where Polaris is located. If you look closely, you will see that Polaris is moving as well because it's about one degree off. Another example of these long exposures, it could be single exposure or it could be multiple exposures resulted from a time-lapse sequence. With digital cameras, when I started in early 2000, 2006 and seven, like this image in 2007, uh, it was very hard to do single exposure, a long exposure image with um, a digital camera. It, it became very noisy, almost useless result. So the only way was to stack a number of shorter exposures. For example, this was about one hour and I stacked 60 image, each one, one minute. Then it became a total exposure of one hour. Today, with newer digital cameras, it is possible to go back to that film style photography uh, technique of just doing one single 45 minutes or even one hour at lowest ISO. But still, um, it became a bit noisy, which you can re remove it later on in post. These are the film style uh, results from um, some time ago on um, from 97, and I think another one is 99. On the right side, you see an image by my colleague, Oshin Zakarian. He's uh, still doing film photography besides his uh, digital camera. He has a medium format um, camera and let it run for three, four hours because the result of these uh, star trails on film is uh, still more natural looking and appealing to the eye than the digital cameras, which becomes too busy with all the trails and all of them are uh, intense. But the main problem in digital star trails is the lack of color. If you see it, look at this picture, you see that most of the stars are white or a bit bluish. Uh, they have lost the color because the pixel received that light, got saturated in high ISO, especially with high resolution digital cameras, 30 megapixel, 40 or 50, it's more difficult to reveal the star colors. Uh, there are techniques to overcome that, but uh, still the most natural result to today is with a film camera if you want to try um, an old camera you have in your garage, especially if it's a medium format, try it next time. Uh, they're still perfect for long exposure star trails under dark skies. But not from somewhere like here. <laughs> this is a problem with um, digital cameras plus airplanes and satellites. In many places in the world, including national parks in the US, in a normal situation. We are now still not far from normal amount of flights uh, overnight because of the pandemic. But on a normal night, there's so many airplanes and satellites, which are usually fainter, that it is hard to get a long sequence of star trails without the need to remove these trails later on, unless you wait for early morning when there are fewer flights. This is Grand Canyon at the beginning of the night, and it's just the image is useless unless, unless you spend hours to remove these trails. And imagine the night, the time when all of these satellites in the mega constellations um, are in a space in new mega constellations of cube small satellites. I not only refer to Starlink, there could be many others in future because there is still no strong uh, fight against them. Uh, it should be true UN. So between many thousands of satellites in the sky and some of them are flaring time to time because of the angle towards the sun. If they don't have proper shield, if they're not in proper altitude from the Earth, they can be visible to a digital camera doing night escape photography, and the sky will be filled with these. And they're visible, even with the shade, they're visible to large telescopes and uh, amateur astrophotographers using a small telescope. So this is a kind of diffuse future for astrophotography in the next um, years. And I'm not certain what is happening. I've been in touch with the Starlink 
um, experts um, uh, gave them few advice, but uh, they're doing their best as well to reduce the amount of reflection using these shades and the right angles and altitude. Um, but I'm not sure what is happening when there are so many thousands of these satellites in the Earth orbit. Back to our topic. Another frequent question I receive on social media is, do we see the same view as you show it in the picture? So I have made some comparisons with my shots. This was in Grand Teton National Park about eight years ago. The moon is rising in the opposite horizon behind me. Therefore, the top of the mountains is lit by the rising moon. As I said, Night escape photography is the art of handling the nighttime light, the ambient light. Uh, but you also need to plan. You need to know when the moon is rising, where to be to get the perfect light, because five minutes after this scene, the moon was starting to vanish the dark sky. Five minutes before this scene, there was no light on the top of the mountains. So it's very timely to plan and to be on the right location at the right time. On the left side, you see the light pollution of the nearby town, Jackson, which is now much larger. Uh, it was eight years ago. And Antares, the heart of a scorpion, is setting over the Grand Teton. What do you see when you stand here and look at the same view? So this would be something like this. The Milky Way would lost its color. Antares is still visible as pale orange. And uh, the mountain is visible. The structure of the Milky Way is uh, so stunning to the unaided eyes. And that's the answer. The Milky Way will be spectacular to the unaided eyes, although you don't see the color. Some of the images in the Tuan collection is far beyond the limit of our naked eye vision, like this one. This is a single exposure of 15 seconds only. One five. And when I took it in 2007, I realized this new technology that is changing the game for astrophotographers. Um, because before that, it was limited to CCD cameras and um, CMOS for deep sky photographers. But having this ability inside a regular DSLR or digital camera showed me that in future, uh, there will be many, many more people who are going to try deep sky photography with just a lens, and not a telescope. This was through a fast lens, a 105 millimeter by Sigma. Uh, Sigma Art Series is one of my favorite uh, lens series. And at 1.4, completely wide open for 15 seconds, shooting from a high altitude lake in Sierra, California during my summer uh, masterclass workshop in, in that area. Um, on the right side is Antares. You can actually see a globular cluster M4 next to Antares resolved by just a 105 millimeter lens, not the telescope. And on the left side is several uh, nebulosity with emission, famous nebula known as cat's paw, for example. It's ju just a single exposure. But if you look at the mountains, get closer to your screen and look at the mountains. There's something odd going on there. The mountains are still are a bit diffuse, almost like moving because I have used a tracker. Star tracker is moving the camera during the 15 seconds because with 100 millimeter lens, you cannot go to 15 seconds on a fixed tripod. You're limited to about four or five seconds. After that, the stars are trailing. If you want to go 15 seconds, you have to follow the stars freeze the earth rotation with the star tracker, then your foreground will be blurred. So there should be a balance between the two. If I go to 30 seconds, of course, the image would be much boldly showing the nebulosity, but then the foreground is completely blurred. This is a limit for single exposure photography. For, for the folks who are doing blending of exposures, there is no limit because they can digitally do any kind of exposure and blend them later on. Another question is, what is the natural color of the night sky? 
And when you look on social media with images of the Milky Way, you see them in all colors of a spectrum. The Milky Way in one image is blue, the other one is purple, the other one is green, red, and sometimes yellow. The Milky Way does not color, change its color every night. So you know that as amateur astronomers, a Milky Way physically has a fixed color. Uh, but people can easily change that by simply changing the color white balance in the camera or in post-processing. As an experiment about 11 years ago, when I first modified a digital camera, um, I posted these two images on Facebook uh, within a few days to see how the reaction of public is. And then one of them got into APOD, uh, the astronomy picture of the day. And the feedback on the right side was 10 times more, almost 10 times more than the actual color. The right side, you're looking at the fake color because this is not the color of the Milky Way. The left side is a bit boring to public, but this is the natural color of the night sky. So I would say this is the reason many photographers are changing the natural color of the night sky to more exotic, aggressive, uh, and saturated colors. But remember, if you're doing this as art, art is not limited to anything, you know. Art is not realistic documentation of the world around you necessarily, but as nature documentary photography, then you're limited to natural colors. To give you an example, if you are a wildlife photographer, you know that an elephant is not purple. Yeah, if an elephant is red or purple, there is something bad going on in your image with the color white balance. Um, and this is the reason you have to decide, are you doing documentary photography of nature? Um, then you have to be careful with the colors of the night sky as well. This is really a good example of the color of the Milky Way made with a film camera by Akira Fuji. Akira Fuji is also listed as the Tuan uh, represented member, but he's not um, one of our main list because um, David Malin is representing Akira Fuji in Tuan. Uh, he's not on social media or internet. He's uh, really a, a pioneer night escape photographer from Japan and is still doing film photography as well. You're looking at the Milky Way from a sugar can filled in Brazil. On the right side is an iconic part of the sky to many Southern Hemisphere nations, the Southern Cross, next to the two brightest stars of Alpha and Beta Centauri. The Alpha Centauri, the bright one, is in fact the closest main star uh, to the solar system, only four light years away. But Southern Cross, although it is pretty small, the smallest constellation out of 88, is very iconic and bold visible in the sky. And it's visible in several national flags, including this most astronomical flag you can find from Brazil. Another Example of the um, relation to other fields, not necessarily astronomy, is when we produce images uh, for immersive media. Some of them are used by VR um, companies for virtual reality, and some are used by planetariums for educational purposes. Like this 360 degree image uh, from Neuschwanstein, the famous castle in Bavaria, in southern Germany is made for planetariums. And we have a show, um, the World at Night Planetarium show as well. We also have a moving planetarium in Germany by my colleague Gernot Meiser called the World at Night. Another planetarium image with the story of amateur astronomers showing a good, good friend of mine in West Texas, Jim Lowry, he's using perhaps one of the largest um, amateur telescopes in the world, 48-inch Dobsonian, uh, home-based, next to his house, um, observatory he's using uh, for not only pleasure, but also to observe, to discover new things. He's working with McDonald Observatory as well, which is just 
a few miles away up on that mountain. And this is one of the darkest places in the US. And I can tell you it's not really easy to observe a telescope when you're up. Um, that's almost you know, 16, 17 feet up on the air. You don't feel really stable. <laughs> But the view is stunning through such a large telescope. There is a very long spectrum of amateur astronomers or astrophotographers. Some are like Jim Lurie using large telescopes. Some, like my friend Scott, he is a voice actor working for Hollywood. But at night, he is a totally different person. He is a person with passion about the stars. He's using just a simple camera and tripod to document this. Some people are just using their own unaided eyes to enjoy the night sky, and some people are using huge telescopes. So this is very wide, the spectrum of people who communicate with the night sky. It's not necessarily, their communication is not necessarily about astronomy, but a part of it is. Uh, I would say we have about more than 1 million amateur astronomers in the world, roughly speaking. It's hard to estimate that. For, um, for an article in the Sky and Telescope, I calculated that just roughly 10 years ago, based on the amateur clubs around the world. Uh, but you can't really define who is an amateur astronomer. It needs to be someone who frequently practice um, astronomy using a telescope or binocular or doing pro-am science, or is somebody who just look at the night sky occasionally and enjoy viewing the constellations. But the connection of them, I think it's the same. The connection of to space, to our past and future at the same time. The connection that you feel of you are getting away from the earth for some moments, from all the news and chaos we have on this world. So these few really rare moments can um, fill you with energy for several days. This is the connection that most of us um, are getting and that takes us more and more out to nature under darkest skies. My story started with um, this telescope back in 92 or 91 and I borrowed it from a neighbor. Um, this is a few years after that and the first look to the moon through this very small, it was two and a half inch reflector, really changed my my world, change my future, because I couldn't believe that there's so many details visible through a tiny telescope. Soon after that, we started a small group. One was archeologists, the other two were passionate about astronomy, and we started to travel to dark skies near Tehran, the capital of Iran, which is very light polluted, so we have to go at least three, four hours away to find dark skies. And photography started after that. Then I became a science journalist. I had a TV program for about 10 years on astronomy in space live every week. But then um, the producer who was uh, the main mind behind it continued uh, after I left Iran. I was teaching um, people, amateur astronomers on practical astronomy and photography. This was my class uh, about two hours away from Tehran. So this would be a different view of Iranian people that you usually see on media. Uh, these are normal people that you usually don't see. And um, they, you know, amateur astronomy is everywhere, regardless of the country, culture, geography, and age, religion. Uh, we are all connected to the same sky. And that's the beauty of astronomy that is really the power we have to share the peace message within the science. I started to document solar eclipses between 99 to 2009, took me to all the seven continents, and we made a documentary series on eclipses. This was in 2005 during an annular a hybrid, in fact, solar eclipse in Panama um, and Venezuela, Costa Rica. In 2009, um, as part of the Astronomers Without Borders effort, uh, I brought this telescope to my friend in Nepal Astronomical Society, 
and we set it up with a few other telescopes. This was the largest telescopes of the society at the time, only an eight inch Dobsonian reflector um, in Bhaktapur Dorbar Square, World Heritage Site. Then they announced it to public and we were doing a documentary film as well about this connection of astronomy and people. And I was really impressed by hundreds of people came to view the moon through, through this telescope. And it was to them, mostly for the first time looking through the telescope, it reminded me of my own uh, teenagehood when I had that first look and it changed my life. I, I strongly believe that this look through a telescope to the moon or Saturn or planet can really change somebody's life when it's in perfect age. And the line was just going and going. <laughs> it was embarrassing. We only had one large telescope that night. Amateur astronomers come together in a star parties around the world. And this was um, a recent one in Maine. Every, every year in August, we have this program in Maine called Astronomy Retreat uh, with good, my my good colleagues, Kelly Beatty at the Sky and Telescope and Bruce Berger. And they arranged this wonderful meeting of about 40 people or so. They're coming from different states um, in this camp. Unfortunately, this year was canceled. And uh, this is a single exposure of 45 minutes where amateur astronomers are moving in each direction with red lights. And some are just sitting next to their telescopes, reading the maps. And then we come to the World at Night project. The website and the social media account is um, noted here. Tuan has been a project of um, International Astronomical Union through the year of astronomy in 2009. We were the first special project of the year. Uh, got connected with UNESCO at the time. And it has been in partnership with Astronomers Without Borders uh, since the beginning. Um, and the message is on one side, one people, one sky. That means we are sharing the view of the night sky, regardless of our religion, culture, and geography and political belief. But on the other side, it shows that the night sky connects us all cultures together through the time as well. Um, that's why we go to the, some of the World Heritage locations, because the World Heritage are icons of the countries. And when people look at these icons, they can quickly reconnect to the night the sky. If you take a, a usual landscape of just trees and horizon, it doesn't have enough impact as when you shoot uh, a national landmark, because people can realize okay, this view is familiar to me. The night sky then is also a part of my life. They can feel that. But getting to these world heritage sites is challenging. You need permission and they're heavily illuminated at nighttime and often they're in wrong locations. So it's one of the challenges we are dealing with. This was an example. A magnificent place in northern Guatemala. It's called Tikal. It's a world heritage area. Plenty of these temples. This is the great temple of Jaguar. And it's related to astronomy of ancient Maya, uh, especially with um, cluster Pleiades, which the Maya were using in their calendar for uh, timing the agricultural purposes. And the uh, Pleiades is also just behind uh, the temple here, but it's a world heritage. You don't have access at night. So I was in collaboration with um, with the cultural ministry of Guatemala there. And then the sky is pretty cloudy usually here because of the tropical area. And you have some minor issues such as uh, hunters, illegal hunters, which may uh, recognize you as um, as a jaguar at night and <laughs> shoot you so that you have to be careful with that. Plus, yeah, it's um, the timing as well. You have to be right at the time when everything is aligned for your story you're going to cover. 
Another example, this is about 6,000 years old, a bit older than Stonehenge, in fact, and it may have similar purpose of timekeeping and calendar. It's in Portugal, near, uh, in, in the area called um, Alentejo, which is a large dark sky site in Portugal, after you left Evora, the, that world heritage site visible in, in the foreground. We are contributing to a program called UNESCO Astronomy and World Heritage Initiative, providing images in order to show this connection of world heritage and astronomy. Another example are petroglyphs. Some of these icons and um, pictures might be related to the night sky. This particular one is interesting because it has some animals which got extinct during the ice age in the Middle East. And they are visible in the petroglyph in central Iran. So that means this picture, some of the layers, uh, at least uh, 15 to 20,000 years old, illuminated by a red flashlight, while the winter constellations are visible on the right side. Same area um, during moonlight then, a surprise came about five, six later. After I was reviewing the image, I realized that there is something I didn't recognize that night. A very small ghost on the top left of the image. Um, let me first tell you about the story here. So it's a leopard, Asiatic cheetah, um, probably lions, and a snow dropping with hunters coming from the right side, about 6,000 years old. When I was taking the picture, I didn't realize this area. In this 10 second exposure, there is an animal looking at me. Wide animal, you know, alive, not a petroglyph. And since it's moved during the exposure, you only see um, a ghost of it. And it's probably a fox. I have many of these in the images. I didn't recognize the animal was in the picture and the clicking of the camera is, um, somehow bring them to, to the site to see what is going on. Another example of history, uh, world heritage and relation to the night sky. This is in New Zealand and this area is called uh, Lake Tekapo and it's one of the famous, most famous southern hemisphere dark sky areas for astro tourism. This new business, uh, new uh, initiative is a real thing now because in many countries um, local economy is based on astro tourism and I can give you examples such as this part of New Zealand in Australia uh, in New Mexico for example in Arizona in places such as Chile which is I would say the leading um, astro tourism country in the world and then uh, Canary Islands these are just some rough quick examples and then comes the countries which you can see the aurora and that's part of astro tourism as well so astro tourism is a real industry emerged from ecotourism and uh, it's growing now because people have noticed the, their disconnection from the night sky in major cities and with new cameras, they can try it themselves. They can take incredible picture of the night sky the first night they try, and they just need dark skies. Babak, I, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. I'm so into what you're doing, I forgot to keep an eye on the time here. Yeah, I just and had yeah, to look too. <laughs> for some questions. Um, would it be okay with you if I took at this moment to run a few by you. Yes, please do that. Uh, I'm going to condense some some of these. But uh, first of all, do you track when you're making your image, your exposures, your single shot exposures? In many of them, not. In some of them, as I gave examples, yes. So it depends on the target. Like this one is a single exposure of 10 seconds with a 50 millimeter lens at wide open aperture of 1.4 and high ISO. Some of my cameras are modified. This is Canon EOS RA. Canon EOS, uh, EOS RA is made for astrophotography. So it's modified by the company itself, recently released, and therefore you can get easily uh, the nebulosity in short exposure. Uh, the, the modification 
is to change the IR cut filter in front of the sensor. Because unfortunately, in a regular camera, this filter cuts the red end of the spectrum where these nebulosities are shining. We call it the H alpha band. And the H alpha band is preserved in a modified camera, the cut happening after this uh, part of the spectrum. So by this modification, the visibility of nebulosity is um, much easier. Uh, you, you receive about four times more of the red light at the end of the spectrum than a regular camera. But on some of the images, I use uh, a tracker as well. Um, hang on just one moment. Uh, I have a question from Adam Block on um, how you handle the bright stars. It appears that there are post-processing adjustments. Could you comment on that? Like this one in order to reveal the colors. Is that the question? Um, well, bright stars, I'm assuming from Adam's question, he's referring to uh, a matter of balance and illumination and the- Oh yeah, so that, that. I, I think it's related to stars getting saturated and, and the, the pixels getting saturated and yes. the stars losing their colors all appear white. That's a big challenge for astrophotography. In night sky photography, I have two approach. One is using a camera with better dynamic range. These cameras are usually low, lower megapixel with the actual pixel size of the sensor is larger. So they get, uh, the pixels get saturated later than usual cameras. Second is scattering the light of the brightest stars to neighboring pixels instead of just one by using a diffuser filter like this image. I have a diffuser filter in front of the lens for only a fraction of the exposure. And by that, uh, the light is scattered, the, the color is preserved. If you look at the center of that um, the star of the Southern Cross, the center is completely white, saturated. It's gone, the color. But around it, the diffuser helped to preserve the color of the brightest star. Can you, or uh, another approach is to use oh. lower ISO. The lower ISO you have, the better dynamic range you have. But then you lose the power of um, uh, capturing details of the night sky. So this is uh, my social media, and uh, you can reach me there too. Uh, my email is just simply bobaktafrishi at gmail.com, or you can just go there uh, slash contact to find me. Uh, there was also... Uh, this, which might be of your interest, the book of the World at Night, this is a teamwork of all the members of Tuan. It's authored by me, but the images is a group effort, and it has been around for several months now. You can get a signed copy directly from my web website, only for the U.S., or you can buy it on Amazon or any major um, bookstore. And it's also published in French, German, and Japanese so far.